Hello, everybody, and it's time for the Me On MMA podcast. Talking about UFC Noche. Is that how it said? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't speak Spanish. I never have been able to speak Spanish. I really would kind of like to learn Spanish, but it is on the table. Uh, this is the Shevchenko versus Grasso rematch card. Pretty dope, actually, for, you know, a free fight. Uh, well, not a free, not a free fight. I, I hesitate to see free fight when, like, you know, there's a cable deal or an ESPN subscription or whatever, but like a non pay-per-view costing fight. There you go. Uh, brought to you by the UFC. That is a title fight. That's pretty cool. Um, it is a weird, like having this like very, very Mexican themed card and we couldn't spring to put it in Mexico. We, we went, we went with Vegas, went with Vegas. Is that the apex? Please tell me it's not at the apex. Please tell me it's not at the apex. Uh-huh. It's not okay. At least it's a T-Mobile arena. Oh, I should have should have looked at that before. Um, yeah, anyways, it's a good card. It's a fun card. It's got a lot of international talent on it. Uh, the betting lines are very, very wide, though. All but three fights are more than plus two plus or minus 200, which is a little disappointing. Um, it does make some of the picks a little bit of a foregone conclusion, but hey, it could still be an interesting fight even if it has a somewhat obvious winner. A uh, quick note here, UFC 293 paydays uh, note. John McDessie released his, like, you know, uh, his uh, his pay stub from the UFC, so to speak, the, the invoice. And, well, it's just, like, another reminder that, like, a lot of the pay is gone before it even gets to the fighter. <laughs> I guess that would be the simple thing. So, I don't know. If, if, if you're still one of these people who's like, man, I would totally fight for 50 grand or, or 10 grand on the bottom end 10 grand for one night of work it's amazing realize a lot of it goes away i'll just i'll just leave it at that it's it's that's not what it is um uh, i'll leave a link to the bloody elbow tweet with the with it there um and and feel free to check it out um i think that being informed about the whole like what the actual labor situation is is pretty cool and pretty necessary uh, for change. Anyways, let's talk about the fights. Valentina Shoshenko, Alexa Grasso, UFC Women's Flyweight title. I should have said Grasso first because she's champion. Um, the rematch. After Grasso managed to rear naked choke Valentina and end her reign of terror. Uh, I was so happy about that. I, I will freely admit that if you want to turn me a Valentina Shoshenko hater, you can do that. It has nothing, it, and to be honest, it has nothing to do with her. A lot of my hate, a lot of my like anti-fighter stances tend to actually have more to do with the fans than to do with the fighter. And what it is is that Valentina had the the Ronda Rousey effect, where people talk people talked her up to this this apex, this level that she just wasn't at. Like a lot of her game, getting to the title, holding the title, and now trying to regain the title is just that she is a mutant. She is she is a freak. I mean that in all the nicest way possible. She is that physical force that most of her opponents just can't deal with. It, and it's not a technical thing. If you if you want to see what her game looks like divorced from that physicality, check out Antonina Shevchenko. Not necessarily the exact same game. Antonina has uh, a couple of things she does better. And a lot of things she does worse, but like it's that same like coaching prospect and whatever. Not 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 prospect. Um, process. That's the word. Uh, coaching process and and largely some of the same technical difficulties. She just doesn't have the physicality to back it up. And fighters that Valentina would absolutely can crush can beat her or give her close fights. So that 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 is the root of my sort of distaste. Uh, I. I I cannot abide an overrun hype train, even if I do believe that Valentina is, was, and may still be, one of the best female fighters in the world. It's just, I didn't like hearing, oh, her kickboxing is so slick, man, so slick. Did you see that? Did you did you see that incredibly well-timed spinning back fist? And it's like, no, no, I did not, because it wasn't there. It was not there. Um... Anyways, let's talk about the five things that I identified that led, led to Grasso beating her the first time. One, 
cardio. She got v Valentina tired. Valentina did not get her tired because Grasso's got phenomenal cardio. And I think that I think Valentina overlooked her just a little bit. I'm hoping to see that improve. Two, um, the counter right hook got taken away from Valentina as a as a painless option to utilize. What I mean by that is that she loves the save time counter right hook. She loves to come in, you throw, she throws, she hits harder, boom, you lose the exchange. Even though you both went one for one, she can follow up with some things or set up a takedown off of it. There are various, various things that she would like to do from that. But Grasso was able to navigate that pretty effectively. She did get hit with it, but she was able to see it coming, diffuse it, keep the range, great range management in that fight in general, and just keep popping Valentina at least make her uncomfortable at range. Um, <laughs> and now we're going to talk about an aspect of range management that didn't go right, but eh, there is that. Uh, number three is kind of related, just like lots of jabs, lots of volume, lots of Sean Strickland, shall we say, performance. Uh, number two, uh, or number, number, where am I? Number four. <laughs> Valentina doesn't like fighting other southpaws. I think that that is, that's not unusual. That's not unusual, but like, I think it, it short circuits a lot of what she likes to do. And then three, she spun and Grasso had the whole spin thing. Very, very scouted, locked in the Renika choke, got the job done. Now we've seen Grasso win, but like everything that I thought Valentina, every, everything that led to my Valentina pick the first time is still present. Valentina is still the more physically freakish fighter. Valentina is still the better kicker of the two, and Grasso wasn't really able to punish her kicks. Valentina is still the better wrestler. She was able to take Valen or Grasso down pretty much at will until the fourth round. So if she doesn't get tired, and she does a little bit more adaptation, a little bit more comfortable with the southpaw, southpaw matchup, a little bit more ideas maybe to find the range to find that right hook that she likes to land and she wins this fight and i am going to pick her again now part of it is a sadness hedge because i want grasso to win if grasso wins i'm gonna be really really happy regardless i'm not and and if i bet on this fight it will be on grasso by the way quick note do not bet on the fights if you can't lose the money because this is mma is a harsh mistress when it comes to gambling. In fact, any gambling is a harsh mistress, but this is even worse than normal. So just food for thought. Grossel's the underdog. I would bet on her if I'm betting. And one would hope, and I, I, I do believe this is the case because Shevchenko is, I think, carrying herself in a manner of someone who is looking to prove something to herself and to the fans that she will be better prepared and ready for what Grasso does. Because that was the thing, is she was able to win the second round of their fight, third round of their fight, and have a competitive first round, was competitive in the fourth round, before getting finished. But it never seemed like she was ready for Grasso. A lot of what Grasso was doing seemed to surprise her, as if, I don't know. She had not done a great deal of actual specific game planning and review for Grasso. And we know that she generally doesn't because like the Tyler Santos fight was much the same thing where it was frustration on top of frustration because Shevchenko could have won that fight fairly easily if she just were to stay at range instead of closing the gap and allowing Santos to clinch with her constantly. I am hoping that this is a new Valentina, that this is a better Valentina, that this is a prepared Valentina Shashenko. That's my hope. And I'm picking her. She is the under, or she is the favorite. Minus 161 to minus 225. Grasso's the plus 135 to plus 188 underdog. Like I said, if you're going to bet, it's Grasso. Uh, there's, 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 
I, I mean, I guess you could put you could bet Valentina at that's at those odds, but like she lost the first fight, you're gonna bet her on her at favorite odds. I, I don't think so. I think that's a bad idea. Kevin Holland versus Jack Della Madalena. Um, I don't know who I'm gonna pick. I have a pick written down here. It is JDM by decision? I will give that away. But. I've also been on the Holland bandwagon a couple of times in the lead up to this fight. Now, I, I will say this. A lot of people, in my opinion, have overreacted to Jack Della Madalena's fight with Basil Hafez. And what I mean by that is that I think that a short notice replacement fight is as dangerous for the guy who is accepting the new opponent as it is for the guy who's coming in on short notice. Assuming that there's not like some like legitimate like health issue with making the weight or something. I... Which is why I think it should be like uh, catch weight. But it's a change of opponent and that had happened a lot to JDM. A lot during J the JDM's prep uh, recently has been in flux. You're going to fight this guy. No, you're going to fight this guy. No, you're going to fight this guy. No, uh, you're not going to fight on this day. We're moving it back. You're going to fight this guy. Nope. You're going to fight this guy. No. And um, it's just, it's definitively problematic. Um, let me see here. Let me, let me, let me get the full, let me get the full, uh, record here. So he was originally supposed to fight Sean Brady on July 8th. That changed to Josiah Harrell, who then pulled out again. And then Basil Hafez, one week later, became the opponent and he performed poorly. I think a lot of people would perform poorly given that case. That's taking you out of your physical, your your peaking process, physically speaking, and you're asking your body to make weight twice because I do believe he actually was in the process. He was pretty close to making weight, if not actually weighed in for the Harold fight. So that is something I think people took away from that a little bit more than they needed to. I still think everything about him is the same. I think he's a top-notch boxer for the division. I do think he's a tad bit one-dimensional for 170. I really do. Um, that is the kind of one negative thing I thought is that I wasn't impressed with his grappling. I particularly wasn't impressed with his decision making as a grappler. That that has me concerned. But he is still a top-notch striker and, well, at least boxer. And super tough, super durable, and will put a pace up there, hit really, really hard, and keep going for 15 hard minutes. Kevin Holland is much more of a hazy uh, fighter for me. Because the key is, is that there are times where Kevin Holland looks really good. Like everything's coming together. He's looking slick on the feet. He's transitioning into the wrestling pretty well. He's generally speaking a very good grappler. And then there are other times where like he looks like a blockhead on the feet. And it'll even be like in the same fight. So like I, I just, I don't know. There's his general reluctance to go to the ground because he wants to have wars. Exonified by the Wonder Boy Thompson fight and he's getting rewarded for it. So like that kind of behavior is going to be impressed further. So I am going to go with my paper pick of Jack Della Maddalena, but I may swap back to Kevin Holland at some point. If you're going to fight Jack's game and it seems like Holland might, you will probably lose it. Because I don't think Holland, for 15 minutes, can mind his P's and Q's in that regard. Because at some point, he will do something silly. So yeah, I am going to go with Jack. That is really, really close. I think it's the closest betting line on the card. Minus 145 to minus 156 on Jack. Holland is plus 120 to plus 130. He is the underdog. I could totally see him winning. There's a door open to him going with his wrestling is for uh <clears throat> P word. Uh <laughs> and me, <laughs> as the vivisection at one point uh pointed out. Uh Raul Rosas Jr. is an inhumanly large favorite at minus 750 to minus 850. I'm just saying, you shouldn't put an 18-year-old that much of a favorite. I am picking him to win. Terrence Mitchell is a guy who, despite his five foot ten frame, does not avoid grappling does not avoid the tinderbox, the hotness, the furnace, the stove that is Raul Rosas' only game. Um, and I think he's just here to lose. 
Like I, I think that is the case. But there is a legit question here. Rosas is coming off his first loss ever against Christian Rodriguez. He rather exploded in the fight. Is he broken? We'll find out. I don't know. I am picking him to win by submission, but like I, I would not go near that betting line. Uh, Mitchell, for the record, is a plus 450 to plus 550 underdog. Is that the biggest underdog on the card? Raul Rosas Jr. is, in fact, the biggest favorite on the card. There you go. Uh, that should not be the case coming off off that performance. I'm just I'm just saying. I think he's gonna win, but like that's that's a bit insane. Uh, Daniel Zell Huber versus Christos Giagos. I'm having a hard time figuring out Zell Huber, and the problem is, is I keep seeing the Trey Ogden fight, and it's just it is so bad. It is so really bad. Like I was, I it was bad enough that like, generally speaking, I don't give up on a prospect after one loss. I I don't. I don't like to, because it's like okay, it's one loss. It's gonna happen. It's a prospect loss. But it was so bad. Um, but he's at Extreme Couture now. I'm assuming Extreme Couture is working on him, trying to make him a little more well-rounded, trying to give him a little bit more fight acu- uh, fight acumen. Trying to get him to be a little more aggressive. Trying to do all of these things that are good. And he's going to come out here and style on Giagos because Giagos is not very good. And I mean, Giagos has been cut, I think, twice by the UFC and keeps getting brought back. Am I am I right that it's been twice? Is this a third run for him? Giagos, Giagos, Giagos. Okay, so UFC run of Christos Giagos. Here we go. Debuted against Gilbert Gilbert Burns in 2014, lost. Beat George Oliver George Oliver in 2015, lost to Chris Wade, lost to Josh Emmett. Gets cut or not renewed, however you want to put it. Wins one, two, three, four out of five fights. Comes back to the UFC, loses to Charles Oliver, beats Mizuru Hirona, beats Demar Hazovic, loses to Dakar Close, beats Car- Car- Carlton Minus, beats Sean Soriano, loses to Saryukian. Moises and beats Ricky Glenn. So it's only his second run with the company. I was wrong. But you'll note that the wins there are over a lot of guys who are no longer with the company. Um, and the losses aren't particularly close. Like that's that that, that that's the other thing. Zell Hooper is much lo- lo- uh, longer than him. Three inches taller, five and a half inches longer. He does have a good jab. He does have a good outside boxing game. He did look good against Lando Venata. He did beat Lucas Almeida, who was a good fighter, in my opinion, on the Contender Series. So, like, he has done some good stuff. One bad fight shouldn't stop me from picking him. Giagos is not nuanced or particularly good tactically in general. He's just kind of a ball of muscle and physical dominance. Let's have it. Let's see what happens. He doesn't do the Zell. He doesn't do the Trey Ogden thing. So it won't be. It won't be the Ogden Zell Huber fight again. Zell Huber by decision. He is a minus two seventy to minus three three thirteen favorite. Giagos plus 215 to plus 230. Fernando Padilla versus Kyle Nelson. I am not a believer in Kyle Nelson, never have been. I think I think my problem, honestly, is this is one of two fighters on the card that I have actually been to the gyms of. I have been to Muskoka Kickboxing. I have been to House of Champions. That is why where Kyle Nelson trains. And I have been solidly unimpressed with those gyms. Don't get me wrong, they have they have they have they have good fighters. They have good fighters. But their fighters that are good are, in my opinion, people who are going to be good anyways. They're kind of raw, good athletes, so on. That's Kyle Nelson. He hits hard. He's strong. He's big. He seemingly has fixed some of his cardio issues. He doesn't fade nearly as badly as he used to. But nothing about his game. Is particularly good. He has good single strike form, but it's low paced. It breaks down under combinations. It's not great when people find their way into the pocket or extend exchanges against him, particularly. And when he mat- matches up with someone who is physically capable of fighting him, it tends to be a loss. His wins are over guys who just 
don't pass the physicality test. And Padilla's not a great athlete. He's not a great physical force, but he's very big. He's crazy. He will extend exchanges with a technical brawling style. He hits hard himself. And I'm picking him to TKO Kyle Nelson. He's the favorite, minus 250 to plus two, uh, minus 250 to minus 265. Nelson's plus 200 to plus 205. That is sadly the fourth closest line of the card. Lupi Godinez versus Elise Reed. This is the feature prelim fight. How this fight goes really just depends on which version of Lupi shows up. Do we get the cyclical strike to grapple, strike to clinch to grapple, to wrestle to grapple version of her, in which case she probably honestly will make short work of Elise Reed in a very similar uh, phase to Sam Hughes? Or we need to get like volume kickboxer Lupi Godinez, which probably still wins, but it's a way closer fight because... She's still working on the nuance and, and and translating her physicality to actually good striking and that confidence. Either way, I'm picking Loopy to win by decision. At least Reed's problem is that she's just physically capped. Like her wins in the UFC are over Jinyu Fry, horribly flawed, flawed fighter, Melissa Martinez, small fighter, and McKenna, Corey McKenna, not small, but like really, really really needs to forget that she's a boxer because <laughs> she has a ridiculously short reach. Um, Godinez knows what she is. She fights a style that, that fits her physicality. I got her by decision because Elise Reed is tough. Uh, I've, she's a minus 450 or 440 to 500 favorite. Reed is a plus 325 to plus 350 underdog. I don't really think a lot more is, needs to be said. Roman Coppola versus Josh Rem. By the way, quick rundown here because I, I did find this funny. There was a tweet some time ago that um, Anthony Hernandez and Chris Curtis was going to turn into uh, Josh Rem versus Roman Coppola as a reference to like how Hernandez's game was going to be stymied by Curtis, but also Curtis's game was going to be stymied by Hernandez. Well, we literally ended up with that happening because it was going to be Chris Curtis versus Anthony Hernandez. We lost that fight. Then it was going to be Anthony Hernandez versus Roman Kopolov. We lost that fight. And now we have Josh Friend versus Roman Kopolov. By the way, a lot of cancellations in this card. We were supposed to have uh, Rodriguez, uh, D-Rod, Daniel Rodriguez versus Santiago Ponzinibbio. Not happening. We were supposed to have Cynthia Calvillo versus Elise Reed. Not happening. We were supposed to have uh, Lupi Godinez versus Sam Hughes. Not happening. Uh, now fighting Elise Reed and Lupi Godinez. We were supposed to have Shotcott Rockmanoff versus Kelvin Gaslam. I'm happy that fight's off because that, that fight doesn't need to happen. We were supposed to have Natan Levy versus Alex Reyes. That fight is not happening. Reyes is still on the card. I can't say that one way or the other. I'm particularly in, uh, looking forward to that. And we were supposed to have uh, Jasmine Luce... Uh, has been Lucindo versus Elise Reed. That got canceled. Then she was supposed to fight Josephine uh, Knudsen, and now she is fighting Lupi Godinez. That's another problem for Elise Reed. Is she has had one, or pardon me, um, Lucindo was supposed to fight uh, Knudsen, and that got changed as well. So, like a bizarrely large number of challenges for the matchmakers has led us with an 11 fight card. Um, anyways, Roman Kopolov, Josh Framed. I am starting to come around on Roman Kopolov. Either that or he's just better. I was either wrong or he's just getting better. Like, those are the two choices. I think he's getting better, but maybe I was just wrong. Kopolov is a guy I, had a, I, I placed a low ceiling on. I was like, hey, this guy's a volume uh, This guy's a volume striker who happens to be knocking out people on the regional scene because they're bad. And he's not. he doesn't sit down on his punches enough. He doesn't really translate his power. He doesn't have f fantastic physical gifts. And now he's knocking people out in the UFC. He's sitting down on his punches. He's harder to face, force off of the front foot. And he is actually landing good counters while pressuring. He is really putting things nicely together. And I applaud that. Still a little bit bad on the back foot. And that is the problem. Because Josh Fremd, not a great fighter. Kind of awkward. Kind of uncoordinated. But super tough. And a guy who can wrestle. Is really, really big. 
and is also a really good scrambler. I could see him doing some a lot of damage and getting some things done, but I also think that he's kind of murdering himself to get to the weight limit, and he's a short notice replacement, and he's incredibly hitterable. Like his striking defense is really, really bad. And I'm, like I said, coming around on the idea that Kopilov can actually hit people and hurt them. So I am going with Kopilov by TKO. He is a prohibitively large favor on Bet Rivers, by the way. If you're going to bet on this fight and you think Fremd is going to win, go to Bet Rivers because uh, here are the lines minus 305 to minus 590 on Kopilov. And Fremd is plus 245 to plus 400. That is insane. That's a little too wide. A little too wide. But I am going to go with Kapilov. Uh Edgar Shires versus Daniel Lacerda. Is Daniel Lacerda the first 0-4 guy to get a second contract? Because I, I am under the, uh, the understanding that most contracts the UFC signs when you come in, whether it's off Contender Series, Tough, Regional Scene, etc., they're all four fights. They're try- and, and they're generally giving you those four fights. Lacerda lost all four of those. Got finished in all four of those. And he's still here. I do get it. I, I, I get what brought him to the dance. He's fun. He's pretty athletic. He's risky. He's an action fighter. He's a car crash you can't look away from when he's in the cage. But he has lost to... Like, literally some of the worst flyweights in the UFC. And he is still here. He has lost to Francisco Figueredo, Vitor Alt- uh, Victor Altamirano, and CJ Vergara. And Jeff Molina. Jeff, Jeff Molina is pretty decent. But he's lost to all of those guys. And he's still here. I don't think a lot of Edgar Shires. Not a lot at all. But he is super tough. He is a decent boxer. He is a decent wrestler. He is a decent grappler. He is a decent athlete. He has an aggressive mindset. He is mentally tough. And he's probably going to win. Probably going to beat the can crusher that is Daniel Lacerda. The meme fighter cam crusher that is Daniel Lacerda. Who only wins in the first round, as you mentioned. Like, only gets first round finishes. And I don't think Shires has ever been finished. Has Shires ever been finished? This is an interesting question. Because he made a decision with Tetsuya Tyra and with Clayton Carpenter. Okay, yes. He got guillotine choked by Jesus Aguilar in 2020. And armbarred by Axel Osuna in 2018. Okay, so been finished twice, but neither by strikes. So yeah, I'm going to go with him to endure maybe a bad first round and then crush Lacerda when Lacerda runs out of gas and can pus and lights himself on fire with the use of his own gas tank. Shires is minus 250 to minus 275. Lacerda plus 200. To plus 210. Now, we get to the actual closest fight fight on the card, betting odds-wise. Tracy Cortez, Jasmine Jasutovicius, and I don't really know why. I'm assuming it's because Cortez has not been in the cage uh, much at all. And not in over, over a year since beating Melissa Gatto. And before that, she beat... Uh, what is this simple on topology? Um, she beat uh, Justin Kish. And Justin Kish, eh, not an amazing fighter. She beat Stephanie Egger, not an amazing fighter. She beat Vanessa Mello, not an amazing fighter. But Tracy Cortez is actually really good. Don't get me wrong. There, there, there are things that are not good about her. Specifically, her stand-up has no lethality to it. Like, there is a distinct lack of finishes on her record. She has 10 wins, two of them by finish. That's a little bit low for the level of competition she's been fighting. That's a little low. But she is a fantastic wrestler for women's MMA. She is a fantastic scrambler 
by any notation, any scale, I should say. And she has a great gas tank. And she's very solid defensively as a grappler. And Jasmine Jasidovicius, who I want good things for because uh, I know some people she trains with. I've been to one of her gyms, Parabellum. And uh, yeah, like I, 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 I want her to do good things. She's Canadian. She's one of the, she's basically in the group of like her and like Mike Malott. I guess Kyle, N- <laughs> I guess Kyle Nelson, even though I, I don't cheer for him. But like, you know, hometown fighter and I want her to win, but she's big and she does rely on, though she has a range striking game, she does rely a lot on being able to clinch up with someone, drag them to the ground. She's getting better at that. She's getting better at finding entries for that. But like against Tracy Cortez, is that a path to victory? No. Really not. Um... So I do have to go with Cortez by decision. She'll get opportunities because, like I said, Cortez is notably unpowerful. But somehow Cortez is only minus 170 to minus 130. And Jacinta Vicious minus 104 to plus 110. Go figure. Charlie Campbell, Alex Reyes. Um, Alex Reyes is a blast for the... I knew I knew the name and I looked up... I, I was looking at his record and went, wait, this guy has not fought in six years. Or like five years and change. What's the deal here? Last time we saw him, he was 30. He is now 36. Um, I have no idea what he's like anymore. Like, like that's too long. I, I, I don't know what to expect. I don't know. He may he may came out, come out as a completely different fighter, for better or for worse. I don't know. But he's had some injuries. He was pretty athletic before. He used to be a good submission hunter before. But his only fight in the UFC was a loss to Mike Perry. I, 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 can't, I, I can't pick him. I don't feel great about picking Charlie Campbell. Charlie Campbell is a mix of like decent fundamentals. I like his uppercut. I like the way he sets things up. I like that he throws in combination. I like the I like some of his kicks. But like I also think he's a defensive mess and like stupid. Like he'll throw spinning stuff for no real reason. He'll throw giant oversized haymakers for no real reason. He trains with Sarah Longo, but doesn't seem to have really any real inc- implication to 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 grapple uh, in any way. Probably a good thing here because, like I said, Re- the, the thing Reyes used to be able to do was grapple. Um, but I am picking him by TKO just because, like, I, how do you pick a guy who's been out for five plus years? Um, Campbell is a prohibitive favorite, minus 435 to minus 480. Reyes is plus 320 to plus 360. Wouldn't bet on it. Wouldn't bet on it. Wouldn't touch it. If you're going to, if you are going to bet on it, bet on Reyes because it's a big underdog. And then the opener will be jo- uh, Josephine Knudsen versus Marnik Man or Knudsen, I think. I think I think because she's Scandinavian, you do pronounce the K. I could be wrong. I'm just thinking of like the Viking show and like King Knut. You know, there's the K sound at the start. Um, Knudsen is a bright is a is 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 a bright prospect, undefeated. Apparently, has some world championships in uh, kickboxing and stuff. I don't know about that. Um, I kickboxing is a weird world. I don't follow it enough to really comment on. And I know that it is there. I know that you can get a world title without actually being particularly good. Andrew Tate is a world champion. I've seen Andrew Tate fight. I don't think that looks like a world champion. Again, probably beats my butt. But I'm a dude sitting here on a swivel chair, on a gaming chair, talking into a microphone about the fights. And you don't want to see me fight. You don't want to see me fight. That being said, if I was in this fight, I would kick Marnik Man in the body. Because <laughs> she is really, really, really bad about defending kicks and also knees to the body. Um, and it's not very good. Like, she's built like a tank. She has a hip toss and head and arm throw game, but not really a particularly good grappler. Knutson seems to be a fairly decent grappler. The only real flaw, well, two flaws. Two flaws I see in Knudsen is she doesn't finish people. She's fine, it's straw weight. And two, she doesn't break the clinch. Like, she is a little bit too willing to, um, even when it would otherwise be advisable to back away and, like, reset at range, 
she gets stuck in the clinch. She punishes people in the clinch. She's good in the clinch. But it does give a lot of opportunities to work Marnik Man's type of takedowns and like the one part of her game that is particularly good. So Knudsen by decision should be interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm very intrigued what she can do. And she's with All-Stars Gym and they're very, very good. Um... I just think that there are there are there are some adaptations to be made into her game that I'm not sure they're doing, but we'll find out long term. Uh, Knudsen is the minus 600 to minus 715 favorite. Man is plus 430 to plus 500, and that brings us to the end of the card. Again for a fight night, pretty good, pretty good. Looking forward to it. Going to be fun. Should be fun, anyways. And uh, we get a title fight. So that's all That's all nice and dandy. Check out the links down below for my social medias, my Discord with the Fight Simulator, and also Super Mega Baseball. Thank you. Uh, my gaming stuff is on there as well, Twitch and YouTube. And I will see you after the fights.